Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll learn to become a better, more business-savvy designer so you can dominate your competition. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and in this episode of Design Domination, I've got attorney Matthew Johnston on again to talk about plagiarism and copyright infringement. Stick around to find out about your rights and what to do if you've had your work plagiarized. Matt Johnston is an attorney in Frederick, Maryland, who works with creative professionals and small businesses on business formation, employment law, contracts, copyright, and trademark law. Matt has been in private practice since 2007 and in solo practice since 2012. He serves on the AIGA Blue Ridge Board and is a frequent speaker on a variety of topics related to small businesses. You can find him online at mattthelawyer.com and johnston-legal.com. Welcome back to the podcast, Matt. I'm so happy to have you here for a third time. <laughs> this is getting to be a pattern. I like, I like it. it. Yeah. I'm having a good time. Yeah, great. So I reached out to you about doing an episode on this topic of plagiarism and copyright infringement, you know, after I experienced plagiarism and copyright infringement yet again. <laughs> so it's happened to me with designs that I have in Cafe Press and Zazzle stores. It's happened with uh, text being copied verbatim from my business website. And then just recently, I found out that someone took a transcript in its entirety from my podcast and posted it on their blog. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that, you know, it's okay to take work and use it as long as you give credit, even though you're not asking permission. Nope. I think that's a huge misunderstanding. That is a massive misunderstanding. Just because you give credit doesn't mean you have received permission. So, I mean, if you're going to use somebody else's work, you have to get permission or it has to be fair use. And fair use is still an infringement. It's just an excused infringement. Yeah. I've since resolved these issues. Well, most of them. But, you know, since I know this happens to other designers, I wanted them to get all the facts about their rights and how to handle this if and when it happens to them, too. Normally, we would spend probably close to about three hours unpacking all of that stuff. But oh, wow. <laughs> let's let's start with, with a couple of concepts. And the, the first one is just a reminder that the person who creates something, whether that's a design, an image, a photograph, written text, whatever, once that's created and put into what the law says is a fixed medium, so a recording, a you know, a website, whatever, the copyrights, there's multiple rights automatically accrue. So it's yours. And from that point on, then the question becomes one of whether or not it's going to be, it's assigned to somebody else, like under, uh, you know, a work made for hire doctrine or something like that, or uh, it's actually transferred according to a license or somebody bought it. And it's a crazy kind of, of starting point when people think about, well, if you publish something and you put it out there, isn't that free for me to use? And the answer is usually no. Right. <laughs> but the fact that it happens is, is often a calculated risk that people make. Um, they'll make the, the decision, well... I know it's not really mine, but I'm just going to use this little, little bit over here, or I'm going to hope that they don't find out. The problem is, is it's not hard to search. Right. That's how I found my latest one. Yes. Yeah. So how did you find out about the transcript? I was doing something completely different. I was searching online for the title of the podcast. So I just Googled design domination, but I was looking for something totally different. And now I can't remember because of the rage that, that I experienced upon finding that violation. I think it, it erased it from my memory, what I was originally doing. But um, yeah, I just, I Googled the podcast name and then I was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> And then it had my picture, which was a stock image that I had modified with a screenshot that I created. And so they were not only using my transcript verbatim from the website, but they were also using a stock image without, you know, having the right to use that either. So it was your stock image that you had created of you? Well, it was a free stock photo, but then I had added a screenshot to it. Oh, and so they didn't have any kind of, you know, any license to use that. 
And they didn't ask any permission either. Okay. Yeah, that's ballsy. Yeah. For lack of a better term. So, and oftentimes people will do this and they'll say, oh, well, I'm being helpful. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I would imagine that if I spoke to this person who did that, they'd be like, oh, well, I'm publicizing her podcast. Well, that may be true, but you're still using things without permission. Right. And there was a there was a tiny link that said, like, you know, you can find it here. And it was so tiny, but there was no need to go to the website. And my name wasn't even attached to it anywhere. So it was just kind of like totally taken out of the website and copied and pasted into their blog like it was their own. It wasn't like they put a summary and then, hey, finish reading this here and had yeah. the link. So the, the funny thing is, is, is the court system, the law, doesn't recognize plagiarism. Plagiarism is, is a kind of an academic term that you hear it in, mm. in uh, academic circles, colleges, and things like that. But the courts do recognize copyright infringement. Oh, okay. And that's what they call it. it it's like it's a copyright infringement to be using somebody's work without permission there's mechanisms by which you can enforce your copyrights, and, and I guess we'll go into that in just a second. But when these cases happen, I generally work from this the viewpoint of most people out there probably don't know the full scope of what's going on. Right. And I try not to ascribe to them evil intent until they show me that that they have some some bad intent. So what you have done, which is I'm guessing reach out and saying, hey, you know, what's going on here? That's not cool. I find that most of the time that works. Yeah, that's um, what I did. Exactly. But I've had situations where people have used my design work in, as their Facebook profile pics. And I go to them and just ask them for a credit and a, like a link to my Zazzle or Cafe Press store. Because, I mean, for crying out loud, I make the money I make from those stores I donate to rescues. And a lot of people in rescue yeah. go and use those designs because they like them and i'm fine with that but i'm just like hey could you at least put a credit line you know with the profile pic and i get nasty comments back to me and they're like well i just won't use it then and i'm like i'm fine with you using i'm politely letting you know i just want a credit line and people like get crazy <laughs> I, I i think people have i mean this is a bit of a tangent but people are in the online world have gotten used to this notion that they can obtain and see and and use content essentially for free right it's like their inventory if they can find it in google right <laughs> it has created this notion that oh well i found it online they put it out there it must be okay to use it's not behind it's not behind a paywall or anything like that right but it it's still th this notion that that it's somehow free to use and then when you tell them not only is it not free to use, or if it is free to use, I want some sort of credit for it. I don't know. I don't know why it offends people. I mean, if I walked up to somebody and, and took, you know, a photograph of their kid off of their living room wall and put it in my catalog selling kids clothing, they'd be offended and they'd have every right to be offended. Right. But that's essentially what's happening. Just because we see it online it seems like we've we've bypassed that notion. And and I'm hoping that it's getting better, but I'm I'm not s always certain that it is. Yeah. So what are some ways that designers can search to find out if their work has been plagiarized? Well, first of all, it is the designer's responsibility. There's multiple ways to do it, but you know, Google is probably your best starting point. You can go to Google. It has a very robust image search function. And you can take your image that you're interested in, you can load it in there and ask it to find everything that works. Searching text is a little bit more difficult, largely because you can look for some sort of clever word put together, or you can search an entire sentence, and you'll get hits that way. Most search engines are pretty good about finding those sorts of things. They're actually that's their purpose. And then if you find infringement, just take screenshots, you know, screenshots that include, you know, website addresses. If you can get details on, say, IP addresses or things like that, that's great. 
And then you could go to Wayback Machine and you could look up when you first published it and take a screenshot there. Well, sure. And well, even if you publish it, like if you publish it, for example, through a blog, through a WordPress blog or something like that, the WordPress system keeps track of when you created it. So when you entered the post, so created it and when you published it for public consumption. It can log the, the date and time that you made some changes. It will log IP addresses. And yeah, the Wayback Machine does work. Um, it's not perfect because sometimes it doesn't index certain things. And if something is behind a paywall, for example, um, the Wayback Machine typically does not index that page. Um, there may be some some exceptions. Yeah, and I've also used copyscape.com where you can put in a URL and then it will show you page results around the internet that might have, well, copy that matches yours, but that may or may not be in violation. Right. You know, there's probably many, many other tools out there. There are certainly paid services out there that will help you do your copyright policing. But, you know, going back to, to the situation, if you're the creator of, of it and you find that it's being, you know... Could you contact a lawyer? Should you? You should when it gets to a point. Hiring a lawyer to send out a nasty gram is usually when things really get crazy. <laughs> because if, for example, you came across this person who had the, this infringing transcript that was up or, or the work that you were using, and I sent a letter out, everybody gets defensive really, really fast. And sometimes it's better to just send an email, send a message saying, hey, look, you know, that's my work. Um, I'm flattered that you think that it's good enough to use, but, you know, that's that's not cool. What you're using it is not cool. And I, and I find that oftentimes people will go, okay. And they either pull it down or they'll give you credit or, you know, something. They're willing to have a conversation. And then as long as they're willing to have a conversation, then it's worth continuing the conversation. But if you get somebody who's like, forget you, I'm just going to go ahead and use it. That's probably when you want to contact a lawyer and start figuring out what your rights are. If it's your work and it's a copyrighted work, then it is your right to determine who gets to use it and who doesn't. So then the question becomes is how do you protect the copyright? As I said at the beginning, the minute you create it and it's in a fixed medium, the copyrights attach. But if you're going to sue for copyright infringement, you have to get that document from the government. Suing for copyright infringement requires one thing, and you have to have the registration. Now, getting the registration is pretty straightforward. It's an online form now. You go to copyright.gov, G-O-V. And right there on the left side of the screen is register a copyright and you submit your work. For most copyrights, it's a $55 fee. There are some things that would be a little bit less and some really sort of esoteric things that would be, you know, more expensive. Once you do that, you're waiting about 10 months before you get the registration. 10 months? Wow. 10 months! <laughs> Unless... You pay an $800 fee to expedite it. Yikes. Yeah. So let's assume for a moment that you've got a potential copyright infringement lawsuit pending. You can go ahead and register your copyright. You pay the $800 fee. It takes a few days, I think. And then you have it. Um, and recently, the Supreme Court made that very clear. They issued a, an opinion. At the beginning of the month, there was some disagreement uh, among the, the intermediate courts of appeal about whether or not you actually had to have the registration, the actual registration document, or if it was enough to have submitted an application for registration. And the Supreme Court says, well, the law says that you have to have the registration. So you have to have the registration. So it means that in order to get that registration quickly, you may have to expedite it and pay the extra fee. You know, once you have that, that the registration, you're in a position to be able to sue in federal court for copyright infringement. If you do have a copyright infringement case that you're going to initiate against somebody, besides having this registration in place, 
what kind of ways could a designer show proof of this infringement? Like, would it be, you know, going to like, say the offending website and then, you know, taking screenshots and things like that? Oh yeah. That's, that's how you would do it. The claim that you file in federal court would be based upon the notion of, I have this registration. This is my work. All right. That's the, the, and you have the registration number and all that other stuff. This person over here, the defendant used these aspects of my work, or they use the whole work or something like that. Um, and here's my evidence of that. And you'd have screenshots or you would have, um, you could have an affidavit. Uh, you could have those sorts of things that, uh, would show that this is what the claim is. Um, you know, the hard part about litigation, any kind of litigation, is that it sometimes takes a while. Even once you file the complaint, you're probably still looking at several months before you get any sort of, of potential for getting close to a trial. So it, it is sometimes a slow process. Um, but oftentimes, once a lawsuit is filed, there are, you know, settlement negotiations that start uh, and things like that. And, and most civil cases in court settle, probably 95% of cases settle. Like what kind of factors determine, you know, how much you're going to get, like financially or whatever the... Right. So um, well, let's start with one thing. If there is an infringement, it either is infringing or it is not. It's kind of like being pregnant. You either are or you aren't. <laughs> there, there was actually a case a little, probably towards the end of last year, where somebody was claiming an innocent copyright infringement. Well, innocent or not is irrelevant. You either have infringed or you haven't. Intent and things like that are functions for determining damages. So damages could be anywhere from sort of nominal damages, you know, basically the court saying, yeah, you did it, bad boy, whatever, um, to if there is a, a knowing and willful violation in infringement, a sort of a knowing infringement. Um, so let's say you had given somebody, that's my transcript, for example, you cannot use it without my permission. I am not giving you permission without a license fee. And they go ahead and do it anyway. They had been put on notice and that's a willful violation. The damages at that point can be as much as $150,000 per use. Mm. Let's say they published it on three websites. That's three uses. That's $450,000 in damages. Wow. And these are statutory damages. You wouldn't have to prove that you were damaged by $450,000. Oh. To claim statutory damages, you have to have that registration. Um, and all we would have to prove is that they knew that they were violating your copyrights, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes the, the statutory damages are lower than that. The court takes in, into account a number of factors when they're determining what the damages are. So every time that a designer creates a project for a client or for themselves, they would have to register that every single design. If they are in a position where they need to sue for, for infringement, yes. You know, obviously there are some interesting problems with that, right? Um, first of all, it's expensive to do. Yeah, Second of all, some of the work that the designers do um, is going to be owned by the, the client. And so it doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense in that case to register a copyright that you're just going to turn around and assign to the client. So most people don't. Where it becomes a problem and, and really the only leverage that, that designers would have if their client is not paying them is to register the copyright. If that happens and the client is starting to use the design without paying for it, um, really the only leverage that the designer has is to register the copyright and threaten an infringement suit. Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, a lot of designers, and, and I'm included here, uh, we retain our copyrights. We allow for reproduction rights. So in that right. case, we would still own the design. But you're saying if it's like, say, like a work for hire or if the client is taking on the copyrights, that would be a way that you could go about that if they're not paying you. Right. So, I mean, even under the work made for hire doctrine, there is 
the presumption that the client has to pay for it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not work made for hire. It's, you know, stealing. <laughs> you know, it would be akin to going into a, a restaurant, ordering food, and then dining and dashing. If the client's not paying for it, you know, the work made for hire contract hasn't been completed because there's been no payment. So the, the designer could register the copyright and threaten the, the infringement suit. If you and other designers that retain the copyright and grant reproduction rights, if the if the client goes outside of the reproduction rights that they've been giving, that's infringement and that's actionable. That that is something that you could sue somebody for. Probably not the best use of your time right away, but <laughs> you know, because again, sometimes it might have been, oh, you know, we forgot to, you know, we were going to do this and we forgot to contact you. Right. And then you sort of retroactively fix it. Like a misunderstanding instead of, or ignorance, you ignorance. know, instead of like somebody trying to, oh, I like your website. Let me redesign mine to look like yours because I've had that happen too. That was a really interesting one. And, you know, or I'm taking the transcript off your website. <laughs> like, geez. Yeah. Some of it's misunderstanding, but if you've granted reproduction rights, you know, I'm a big believer in Hanlon's razor, you know, never ascribe to malice that which can be explained by stupidity. <laughs> and, you know, some people, it's not they're being stupid. It's just that they're just not thinking. Right. And and most people want to be on the right side of law. Most people want to be doing things fair. And once you just point it out to them, most people are, are happy to figure out some sort of resolution to the problem. If you get into a copyright infringement suit, um, I, I always look at that as kind of a last resort. Something has, you know, everything is broken down um, because litigation is expensive. It's time consuming. Um, and it, it, is, it is rarely going to be a situation that even if it turns out 100% great, it does come with its own costs in terms of psychic costs. And of course, you got to pay a lawyer. Um, unless you want to represent yourself in court, which is good luck with that. <laughs> is that a more difficult type of case to win when representing yourself? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, being in federal court, you know, there are rules. The rules are published. But, you know, if you're suing a defendant for, for copyright infringement, they're, they're going to hire a, an attorney. And, you know, I tell people all the time, all things being equal in a case Oftentimes, the lawyer who knows the rules better is going to win. But since most designers have a have a have a company, an LLC, or something like that, in most cases, you have to have a lawyer. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. So, companies can only act through humans. Uh, a company that is filing a lawsuit, in almost ninety nine point nine percent of the cases, if you're in federal court, you have to rep be represented by an attorney. So one, one of the things that we had sort of chatted about before is what happens if you do file a suit? When you file a suit, you know, the defendant is going to say, uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> and they'll do it in a, you know, sort of a nice lawyerly way. But basically, they're going to say, I didn't do it. It's not infringement. And even if it was, I have fair use rights. So you get into the fair use doctrine. So fair use is a defense. In order for fair use to even be considered, there has to be some potential for an infringement. So somebody has used your work in some respect. The defense of fair use basically says that even though the copyright holder, the creator, has these rights that are exclusive to the copyright owner, fair use is an allowance or legally termed a privilege to allow for a class of uses largely uninhibited. And some of the most common ones are things like news reporting, criticism, academic use in a classroom. So fair use is used to allow for those things to happen. Well, could that also potentially be like somebody sees a project on my website and then they put it on their blog and like the, an image of it on their blog and then they talk about it. Like they might say, hey, this is crap or hey, this is freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah, doing that is considered criticism, and it would be a fair use in most circumstances. Now, there's some things that a court has to look at when determining fair use. Courts are required by law to look at 
and here's where we get a little lawyer nerdy. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to look at the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the work, which is the nature of the work that has been infringed upon, the amount of the work that has been used, and the effect of the infringing use on the potential value of the infringed upon work. All right, so sort of break that down a little bit. So purpose and character of the use. You know, we're talking about somebody who copies some segment of a website that you have done and they're criticizing it. They're, they're doing a critique on it. Maybe they don't like the colors, you know, whatever. Um, the purpose of that is not to steal your work, but to criticize your work or to instruct the public about sort of the elements that went into it. Or maybe praise your work. Or maybe praise your work. <laughs> Um, it's not in that case, they are using it for a critical approach. And as such, it would be most likely deemed a fair use. If the nature of your work lends itself to easy identification. Like if they were to provide a link or something, or like to say that it's designed by Grazer Graphics, or if it has like, you know, my business logo in there or something. I mean, yeah, it could. If they could determine the source of the work or they recognize the work. You know, you think about some of like the uh, like uh, the iconic pictures, like the the Beatles in the, in the picture of them crossing Abbey Road on the cover of their of their album. Okay? That's an iconic picture. And if you are using the Beatles picture, that could be an infringement thing because the surviving guys in there, the estates of those who are dead, they own the rights to that probably. If the nature of your work is such that it is easy to copy, uh, easy to use, and stuff like that, the courts start to get a little bit pickier. If it's a large-scale work like a multi-page website or a book, they each have their own sort of characteristics. One of my favorite copyright cases has to do with the Rolling Stones and K.D. Lang. The Rolling Stones had a song called Have You Seen My Baby? It had been put out, and Katie Lang had a song. Her big song was Constant Craving. They have the exact identical melodic string of, of, of notes and stuff like that. Pretty sure I got this right. When Katie Lang was writing the song, she had heard the Rolling Stones. One of them heard the notes, copied the notes, and in order to avoid a copyright infringement lawsuit, they simply agreed to give the others songwriting credit. So they avoided the suit. The whole purpose of the fair use is to allow for people to sort of think about it and criticize it and report on it and not get into a problem with the copyright holder. But when someone's using, when someone's doing fair use, if that's their intention, mm -hmm. fair use, does that mean that they should or shouldn't be like, hey, this work was designed by, you know, blank? Like, should they not give you credit or is it, because it, how does that work? I think it depends heavily upon what they're doing. So if they're going to be criticizing the work, whether good or bad, they should be providing a link to provide context. Are they legally required to do so? No. But they do have to be mindful of how far they go, which gets into the third factor, which is the amount of the work that is used. Let's take some, a design that you did. Others already have. <laughs> yeah, others already have. And let's say a designer has, they look at it and they go, oh, I really like that graphic. And they use a whole bunch of the graphic. Whatever you created, that's going to be a problem. But let's say they're looking at a photograph that, that you took for whatever reason. And there's like some clouds in the sky. And they go, oh, that's such a cool cloud pattern. I want to use that. And they just use that little bit without using any other aspect of the, of the photograph. Chances are they're going to be in a fair use world because they're not using the entire work. And it wouldn't necessarily be recognizable by me if I saw it too. Right. It, not necessarily. So when the courts are looking at the amount of the work used, it's often used in conjunction with what's the purpose of this potentially infringing use. You know, amount of the work matters. There was a, a famous famous case in copyright circles. I know I talk about famous cases and most people don't give a toss, but um, <laughs> if if you're aware of, of uh, Google Scholar, one of the things that Google Scholar had done was digitize 
millions of books in, mm. from a bunch of libraries. And you can do research through Google Scholar and find books that have a particular phrase. And it'll return like four or five lines of the work. And a whole bunch of authors and, and the Authors Guild, the Writers Guild sued. And the court said, well, they're not using that much of your work. They're using like four lines. You know, so whatever phrase you searched on, you get like the two lines before and the two lines after. And the court said that that's not enough of the work to constitute an infringement. You know, the lawyers were arguing, well, somebody could piece together an entire book doing it that way. And the court was like, okay, yeah, sure. But at what time and cost? Which sort of gets into the, the fourth factor that's, that's required to look at is, what's the effect of the potentially infringing use on the overall value of the work? In this Google case, four lines is not going to impact the value of the original work. Using, you know, a couple of, of square centimeters of a picture of clouds when you are, that you took a picture of, you know, a sculpture is probably not going to be considered infringing because it's not truly affecting the value of your work. So the courts are required to look at, at those four factors. They can look at other things, but they're looking at those four factors. And it really does boil down to, does this infringing use impact the value of the work? And, you know, for example, if they're using it in a commercial context, you know, they took your website design and they did, you know, they copied it and they sold it to another client. That's commercial use. And, you know, yeah, you're going to lose on that. Sorry, I got to do my lawyer thing. You're most likely to lose on that. <laughs> I know it gets really sort of fact specific and it gets really hyper technical and it may be more than what, you know, listeners are particularly interested in. But if people are using your work and it gets to the point where you are, you have to sue, you just have to sort of be prepared to address the argument of fair use. Because it's going to come up on from the other party. It, it is the most used defense in copyright infringement cases. If it's not asserted, I generally get, I would be floored if it wouldn't, if it's not asserted as a defense. Okay. I have a question back when you were talking about copyright registration. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does it ever matter when you register a copyright versus the date of the infringement? If you don't register the copyright on something until after you see that somebody's plagiarized your work, like let's say they plagiarize your work on, you know, March 1st, and then March 3rd, let's say you go and register that copyright. Does that matter? I mean, that you didn't register it prior to the infringement? Uh, yes and no. Oh. Uh, <laughs> here's the important part. Because we can't go around registering copyrights on every single piece of work that we do. Right. Like you said earlier, it's just cost prohibitive. It's cost prohibitive. When you file the copyright registration, you have to tell them when you created the work and when it was and when it was published or created. Okay. Um, and so you can do it after the fact and you can do it even after the infringement. Okay. So you just have to be able to prove, well, this is when I published it. Okay, so if you published it on a on a blog, for instance, there's the date time stamps of the blog, right? And there's metadata behind it and all kinds of stuff that you would get into. It. But you just have to assert that this is when I when I did this. And that would be in the electronic file as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. So you know, yeah. The, so for example, the recording that we're doing right now, you'll publish it at some point, but this recording itself, the recording is now subject to copyright even before you publish it so when we're done um you know the copyright attaches so the date for that purpose doesn't matter as long as you have the date of when you published or created the work so there are a few sort of technical times for example if you register the copyright within i want to say three it might be six months if you register between three and six months of the creation, you are entitled to the statutory presumption of creatorship, authorship, and ownership. So there's a statutory presumption. 
you know, somebody can try and overcome it, but it's hard to do so. But if it turns out that you need to register the copyright because somebody stole it three years later, you still have the right to go back and do that. You don't have the statutory presumption. You would have to prove when it was published. The question that you presented of is somebody registered, if somebody infringed it on March 1st and I registered the copyright on March 3rd, that's largely irrelevant, except in, except in sort of the, the legal damages world and, and proof world and, and evidence world. If you're in a situation where you do have to register a copyright in order to protect your rights, the fact that you found out about it and then registered it uh, is not a bar to filing the suit. Okay. You know, in general, I try and tell designers that designers or anybody, any creative that has created something and they see people infringing on it, reach out first in as non-confrontational a manner as you can. You know, don't ascribe malice. You have to make a calculation. There is a, a cost-benefit calculation to it. I don't say ignore it, but, you know, if it's a one-off thing and it's going to cost more in time and effort to, to police it, then, right. you know. Yeah, it's a pain in the yeah, butt. <laughs> make a decision along that. But if it's an ongoing sort of problem, you know, it's not worth it. You, you spend a lot of time and energy and effort and, you know, creative juices to create something. Yes, it's great that you've put it out there for public consumption, but it doesn't mean the public gets to just rip it off. At the end of the day, it's the creator who has to police it. You know, the government doesn't do it. The police can't do it. Um, it's, it's up to each individual creator to make the decision as to what is reasonable and what is not. Um, and if you think the use is unreasonable, the law protects you as the creator. Well, great. Well, thanks for coming on again. I appreciate it. This has been great. You're welcome. If you found this helpful, please leave a review and like and share it on social media. Join the Design Domination community on Facebook and go to creative-boost.com to download free resources and apply for design coaching. <laughs>